Hey, Cleveland, this is the baddest man in professional wrestling, Raymond Rowe, and you are listening to The Sports Fix. Open Gangnam Style. Welcome back to The Sports Fix Live. Yeah, we do a Gangnam Style. We do it all kinds of style, baby. On the line, our special guest, Brown's Great. Without this man, there is no dog pound. Hanford Dixon. <laughs> hey, big dog. You know, y'all got it going on over there. I was sitting there watching y'all. Y'all got a good show, man. I, you know, I've listened to your show a lot, man. I got to compliment you guys. You got a really good show going there. It's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. Open Gangnam Style. Sports Fix listeners, do you tweet? So do we. So tweet with us 24 7 at the Sports Fix CLE. Hey guys, J Rock here from the Sports Fix, and we always talk about using our platform to try to help the world and the society we live in. And everywhere I go and everywhere we go, bullying is one of the problems in today's society. There's nothing worse than any person, big or small, strong or weak, adult or child, feeling picked on, pushed around, vulnerable, and victimized at the hands of a bully. Change comes one person at a time, and my good friends at No Such Thing as a Bully are working on skills and techniques and ways that we can all change and make things better for everyone. Find out more at nosuchthingasabully.com. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Catch every UFC pay-per-view live in full HD at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, just outside Great Northern Mall. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. You got that right, radio voice guy. It is indeed that time. Welcome back in. Time to get your fix, baby. It's time for the Sports Fix. J-Rock with you, and it is crunch time indeed for the Cleveland Cavaliers. We're going to talk about that. It's beyond crunch time. It's beyond parade time. It is championship off-season time for the Lake Erie Monsters as they took care of their business this week and brought a championship home to Cleveland. We're going to talk about that here. Matter of fact, momentarily, the Indians got things going as they're in the middle of a series with the Royals right now. Actually, they're heading into one with Can- or with uh, Chicago. They're in the division here for a run, and it's nip and tuck. Tough loss last night if you're listening live. We're going to get into all of that with Dan Wismar. So much to do. I'm not going to lie. It's, it's, it's tough. I-, I told some people this morning, as I was getting prepared to uh, to come on the air and doing my show prep, guys, and, and bear with me here for a moment. I know this is the sports fix, and we'll get into the, you know doing our thing here in a moment, but it, it was hard to do just that for me this morning. Uh, I'm sure many people out there felt the same way. I had mentioned this on my social media even late last night. I'm scrolling through my news feed on Facebook, and I've always said that I think my, my various social medias are a great... Uh, slice into just the the veins of society and the Cleveland particularly because I've got so many. I mean, I've got 5,000 friends. I've got another couple thousand followers on my personal page. I've got 20 some thousand people connected through the sports fix. And and so when you when you look at your timeline, you get a really wide kind of swath through things and uh, anyways it's great for sports and a lot of times it gets me all kinds of different opinions and takes on stuff and and it's great for that kind of stuff but I mean man last night I was scrolling through and obviously uh, right off the bat condolences uh, in Orlando one two three in a row big big tragedies I mean huge Huge news coming out of Florida. You guys have heard uh, Christina Grimmy, the singer, and then the attack at the nightclub that killed 50 people and injured 50 more. Uh, last night, a child watching some movies on the beach at Disneyland and a two-year-old baby gets eaten and dragged away by an alligator. I mean, it was just one thing after another, but those are the the big national stories that all of us are being hit with. And in between that... As I'm scrolling through my news feed last night, I came across three different situations where somebody, not anybody that I'm a a daily real world talking person with, but, you know, through these relationships that you forge on social media, we all have them that are that are 
uh, strictly online friendships or, or people that you just see every day. You see their posts. They're like me, hey, if you follow me, you know every day you're going to get a picture from the gym. You know every day you're going to get something about my wrestling. Every day you're going to get plugged for the sports fix. You kind of know what you're going to get. And and my news feed is very similar. There's a lot of people that I may not know in person, but I go, up. Oh, there's that person's whatever for the day. Well, you know, as I'm rolling through last night, I come across three different people who either they themselves or that account, I should say, had passed away and it was being updated by somebody else. And I mean, I'm sure we've all seen those things happen before. And you know how they say, you know, you think back to the last time you talked to somebody or whatever uh, when they pass away and how time is so precious. But with Facebook, it gives you the ability to see it in person. And so in a couple of these instances, I went and I went under that person's timeline. And it's so chilling to to see that last innocuous post that somebody made on Facebook never to post again. And, and the next post is somebody saying, my wife, my daughter, my husband, my whatever has passed away and I'm updating their account and you look and it just and it gets me to think and I post my picture from the gym I mean who any day that picture from the gym saying go get better J-Rock daddy give it up one time that could be it it could be the last thing you post but when you see it like that and you see somebody go hey I had baked beans for dinner now I'm gonna go watch a movie and then they know that's it the next post is this person you know uh not with us anymore it just really you see it and you just it, it really puts a uh, picture sometimes to just not just the mental thought of how uh, any moment could truly be it so all of that stuff hitting me last night I mean I was just kind of overwhelmed with uh, with a sense of I don't know sadness I guess would be the word and got up this morning I told a couple of people I had the hardest time getting into the sports mood today and and this is hey just like our jobs just like sports like the NBA finals like Major League Baseball it's all therapeutic it's all things that help distract you from things like what we're talking about here and that's what we do and that's my job that's our job and we're going to do it we're going to do the sports fix thing here we've got tons of things to get into but I just wanted to be honest you know me man I I lay my heart on my sleeve with you guys I've done it for eight years now and uh, we just passed the anniversary of the show now the eighth year and I'm never going to change that and if you don't like it then you don't like me because I'm going to lay it out there and that's just uh, you know the way I am and this morning I just found it so hard it, it really it also puts into perspective those cliches that we use I'm in sports talk baby so I'm always using cliches like do or die the Cavs you heard it like crazy oh they're down three to one it's do or die it is not do or die it might be win or go home but do or die is real life and and there is no uh, rematches there is no free agent acquisitions after that so you know, it just kind of puts all that stuff into perspective. It has been a tough couple of days in this country. We're a tough country. We pull together. We pull, And that's one of the things, though, that scares me, too, is as I'm talking about looking down my news feed, and I got to wrap this up. I know I'm not talking about sports at all. But as, I, as I'm looking, I've, I've realized for months and years now, and I'm seeing it so much, never before do I recall seeing our country so divided into so many subgroups, niche groups, subcultures, the lines drawn between this group and that group. And if you don't believe this, you can't talk to me about that. And if you're not in this group, you can't be with that one. I've never seen our country as divided into these niche subgroups as, as it is right now. And, and as many people know, that is... That is the, 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 the downfall to many of a society is, is, is many times when people are looking for power, they look to split people, to divide the masses, to have everybody in fighting. I've never seen so much division amongst our country, and, and it just scares me because it, it grows by the day. It doesn't get better. Even when we come together in moments of tragedy and heal, we don't heal together anymore. We heal in subgroups, and it's, you know, we've gone to a world where niche broadcasting, niche programming, it became such a thing. It's okay if you don't like to do the mainstream, here's a group for you, and that's fine. Everybody should feel accepted, and everybody should feel included in whatever they do in life, but I think it's kind of created the society that we have now where there's just so many splintered groups of people that... Uh, consider themselves Americans just like you, unless 
you think this way or that way or this way. Guys, like I said on my Facebook this morning, we can be better. We can do better. I struggle every day keeping life in perspective, but I know we can do better, and I know that we are better, and we've just got to keep working at it, keep lifting each other up and 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 just – you know, whatever. I'm lecturing and going. You guys know where I'm going, guys. I get it. It's the sports fix. I did 10 minutes of this, and and let's do the thing. But, guys, seriously, lift each other up. Look around. See how you can help somebody. Like I said uh, uh, earlier this morning, uh, as much as I get mad sometimes, sometimes you just got to try to figure out, instead of how can I criticize this situation, how can I help this situation? If I can't help this situation this way, maybe I can that way. But it is what it is. We are in this together, whether you like it or not, and none of us know how long we're in the fight. So answer the bell each round. Get out there and swing with every freaking punch you got because you never know when the next round is coming or if. The next round is even coming for you guys. With that, let's rock and roll. We're talking sports fix, talking about the next round coming. We're going to talk Cavaliers here in a moment because they are down to the final two rounds and they need a knockout to prevent themselves from losing this NBA Finals. Let's do it. Welcome to the Sports Fix. I'm your man, J-Rock Daddy, coming at you live and in living color. Jerry Myers, call me what you will. Call me happy to be doing the Sports Fix with you here each and every time we get the opportunity to do it. So blessed to join you across the Sports Fix Radio Network. Maybe you're listening live on TuneIn, TuneIn's mobile apps, digital apps worldwide, Spreaker, Mixler, their respective digital and mobile applications as well. Perhaps you're one of many that enjoys the show right off of our home base, thesportsfix.net. If you haven't already, please bookmark it. It's a great place to listen to the show live as well as support the banners for our great sponsors that help bring this bad boy to you free of charge all day long, every time we do it. Check it out, thesportsfix.net. As well, shout out, can't forget the thousands of you listening around the world on digital delay, and I mean around the world. Stations and sites and places and countries, you name it, all over the place, like 96.7. WFSN FM in Union City, Pennsylvania. Welcome to everybody listening on Union City's WFSN 96.7. Welcome to everybody listening around the world on iHeartRadio, the world's largest internet radio provider, on iTunes, on Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, and all the other places that you feed, subscribe, download, do the thing, and get your fix, baby. Thank you so much. Without you, there is no us. 216-539-7535 is the number to call. 216-539-7535. I'm going to jump to you guys momentarily. 15 minutes from now, new Dan Wismar in on the conversation as well. I'm stopping everything. We're not taking phones. We're not doing anything until we give it up one time (laughs) for the Lake Erie Monsters, Daddy. Your 2016 Calder Cup champions, 19. 15,000 plus fans filled up the queue the other night as the Cavaliers complete, or excuse me, oh, well, from my lips to God's ears, as the Monsters completed a sweep of the Calder Cup finals and playoffs in general. 15 to 2 run through the playoffs, 5 and 0 in overtime games, including overtime in the championship clinching victory that 19,000 plus at the queue the other night largest of course you would figure in monsters franchise history how about second largest in the 80 plus year history of the calder cup playoffs an unbelievable showing thousands more downtown cleveland this week for the calder cup championship plaza celebration and they're going to continue the celebration opening weekend next year will be a double header they're going to raise the banner and give out the rings and and have some all kinds of craziness going on down there the monsters though got it done a season that looked like it could be special early went through some struggles in the middle and then really got on a roll and the monster when they got to the playoffs they did not look back and They brought the Calder Cup home to Cleveland, baby. Give it up one time for the Lake Erie Monsters. And and, and enough cannot be said for the support the city of Cleveland gave them. We've talked about this forever. Cleveland fell in love with the Monsters a long time ago. And the Monsters repaid that with a Calder Cup championship. And uh, it's the first hockey title in the city of Cleveland since the Barons in 19. 1964. Uh, I'm not even getting into entertaining the arguments about whether or not you think it counts or it doesn't count. I know 20,000 people thought it counted the other night. About 
350,000 people all season long thought it counted just fine. A couple thousand at the plaza parade. It wasn't really a parade. It was a plaza celebration. Uh, you, you tell me what you want. The Lake Erie Monsters are a hell of a product. I get the argument that it's not one of the uh, big three sports. That being said, uh, the AHL has been around 80 years, and uh, the Monsters, as, as I said, their fans don't treat it as anything minor league. Either way, hopefully they just continue to get the ball rolling. We talked about Stipe doing his thing. And by the way, uh, speaking of that, Stipe Miocic, his first UFC heavyweight title defense is going to be September 10th here in Cleveland against uh, Alistair Overeem. It looks like, I don't believe it's official just quite yet, but it looks like it's going to be locked into stone. You may not have gotten the announcement just yet, but it'll be a double header of sorts for the two local UFC fighters as Jessica I, my home girl, she is going to be out there as well. Beth Correa looks to be the next opponent on tap for her to snap out of her losing streak and get things. She can't have a better place. We were just talking about this the other day. She cannot have a better place than the crowd going crazy uh, at home and doing the thing right here in Cleveland. So look for that to be announced very soon too. All right, guys, we've got just about 10 minutes before I get to the news and get to the phone lines. Dan Wismar is going to join us from Everybody Hates Cleveland. Now, let's switch gears and let's talk a little bit about your Cleveland Cavaliers. I see the phone lines ringing. Give me five minutes. I'm going to go get to some takes on the phone line here. 216-539-7535. Since we left, last left ye here on the Sports Fix, you guys, the Cavaliers had fallen down 0-2 in that series with the Golden State Warriors and not just fell, but got bushwhacked and ransackled, uh, just blown out to an NBA record defeats in the first two games of this series. Then the Cavaliers came back to Cleveland, and it was an entirely different game. The Cavs punched first in the third game of the series, knocked the Warriors on their keister, and they didn't get up. Cavs rolled to a blowout of their own in Game 3, looked to have set the stage for a tied series coming out of Cleveland where each team would hold serve on their home court. Cavaliers had the game in hand for about two and a half, three quarters, although in game four, you could really see, even with that lead, the mistakes that the Cavaliers were making that could and did come back to haunt them. But as they were happening, you could see them and go, boy, this the Cavaliers are lucky that they didn't make them pay for missing that guy or leaving that guy open for three. And sure enough, by the end of the game, Golden State had turned it. And not only had they turned it, they got in in the players' heads. LeBron was incredibly frustrated. He had the deal with Draymond Green, which had huge ramifications on the back end, which is why he ended up suspended for game five. But uh, LeBron went out of his game in the last few minutes and a couple of uh, unneeded turnovers. The Cavs just got frustrated at home and put themselves on the brink of the end of it all. Down 3-1, to one, leaving Cleveland. Golden State heading home with a chance to wrap up the series and the championship at home against the Cavaliers. Everybody writing the Cavaliers off at that point. All in. I'll tell you what, if you go all in at the casino like you go all in on the Cavs, some of these fans out here, it's illegal. You'll get arrested. That's, it's like It reminds me of those guys at the casino that try to, put the, try to slip the extra bet onto the table at the casino. They try to slide their hand out there and drop an extra coin or two when they know they're going to win. But then when they see that they're going to lose, they try to pull some of that bet back. And, the, you know, that's illegal. That's what the Cavs, the Cavs fans have been illegal. Not the true diehard Cavs fans. But, boy, my timeline has been a, a, a yeah, all in, all out, all in, all out, kind of in, not sure. Maybe I'm in. I don't know. It, it's amazing. But uh, that it is what it is. They've, they've beaten us for 52 years in this city, and Cavs fans are a a fractured bunch mentally, that's for sure. But, uh, you know, all of that going on, it looks like it's the end of the, of, of the day, and, and the Cavaliers put themselves in a position to have to set NBA history. No team ever coming back from a 3-1 deficit in the NBA Finals to win. Uh, only two teams in that position have ever forced a Game 7, and those were back in 51 and 66, and neither one of those teams obviously lost or or won the championship as they both lost in a Game 7. But out of 32 teams that were down 3-1, to only two ever forced it to a Game 7. Everybody else lost in Games 5 or 6. Cavaliers have to win three in a row to do it, and they have to win. One of those would be a Game 7 on the road, and Draymond Green will be back. As Green was suspended, 
taken out and and so much. I, I cannot wait to get Dan in. I kind of want to wait on this, but Tim Donahue, the referee who served time in prison for fixing the uh, point spreads of NBA games at the end and having his little gambling scandal that the league tries to pretend didn't happen. Uh, Tim Donahue even chimed in and said that was a, a, a usual standard deal that by the NBA there to try to monkey with the strings of the series. And I'll say again, people say, oh, rigged and fixed. I'm not throwing out big words like that. Thumb on the scale, that's the word that I use because I do believe that perhaps the NBA, at the end of the day, they say, hey, whoever wins these things wins. But they definitely put the thumb on the scale to to play with the waves of these things for maximum entertainment value for the fans. And I'm sure that that's how they justify it. Although I say it's maximum financial value. As my buddy was telling me the other day, he's got season tickets. Uh, His row of tickets, he's got three seats. Every playoff game, it's basically $1,000 that they get from him uh, every playoff game. And and I've told you about the system, about how they get guys to uh, commit to the whole series ahead of time. But, you know, think about that. Even just milking one or two extra games out of these series makes a ton of coin for the NBA. So, you know, obviously Tim donahue has got his own credibility issues because he went to prison, but he kind of knows what he's talking about because he went to prison for doing exactly what he's saying. But I, what I found bigger about what he said was not about Green being suspended because the NBA wanted Cleveland to win a game and extend the series, which makes total sense. Think about this. In the same situation in the last series, when Golden State was facing elimination, they did not suspend Green for what looked like a much more egregious situation than they did in this one when the situation behooved the NBA for Green to be out. When it behooved the NBA and the extension of a series to keep him in, they kept him in. And then when it behooved them to keep him out, they keep him out. On top of the fact that this has been the worst officiated playoffs, 1 through 16, all the way through every team, not just Cleveland. Worst officiated playoffs ever. The fans are all over the place saying the league is fixing this. But then when Donahue says that, but what I found bigger was when he talked about how in the filming sessions between the games, how the league w- would not implicitly say it, but the way they directed the officials to coach the, or excuse me, to officiate those games would always be intrinsically supportive of the team that was trailing on the scoreboard in the game. You know the old adage, every team makes a run in the NBA? It makes a lot of sense when you think of it from that perspective, because of course they do, because it behooves the NBA for there not to be blowouts, because then people leave early, tune out early, don't go to bad games, but when every team makes a run, when every team has a chance... You get a lot more, uh, you know, they want to, They want the NFL's parody, and if you've got to put your thumb on the scale a little bit, you do it. I don't think anybody's fixing games. I'm not one of those conspiracy theorists, but I definitely think that the NBA manipulates these things for maximum financial and entertainment value. I've got just a couple of minutes. We're going to pick this up with Dan Wismar in a minute. I want to give you a shot on the phone lines. Caller, you're next up on the Sports Fix. Big Daddy of Destruction, J-Rock, it's your boy, Ronnie Rodney here today. Uh, just giving a call in because it wouldn't be any other way besides the clear way to go about it. It's a rough road. I know we're down right now. I've seen a lot of people lose faith, which has made me sick. We've already heard my opinion on that, so I'm not going to get too much into that. But it'd be no other way to Cleveland than to go against the history of the NBA and come back and win this thing. Uh, I'm sure you you have some pretty good stats there uh, showing the history of the finals and teams being down 3-1 or 3-2. I'll let you get into that a little bit later. But uh, it's just I, I can't wait to be down there Thursday. The atmosphere has been insane. Uh, it, it, I've come home with my ears ringing uh, for days upon end. Uh, I'm sore. There's no one. I mean, sore. We're, we're standing all four quarters down there, jumping around. Everyone's just loving the atmosphere. I don't see this going any other way but our way here in Cleveland. Uh, those boys dropping 41 the other night, setting history. Um, you know, if we're, if we're making history, then we could break history. We could break that. Uh, that no team has ever came back from a 3-1 deficit in the finals. 
I think it's very funny, though, that all my friends who are Golden State Warriors fans all of a sudden have a different tune. It's almost like they were in this situation last round, you know, being down 3-1, thinking your team's not going to be able to do it, and then they pull it off. It's going to be really interesting being down at that parade when I get to see all my fans and all my friends and all these people down there who have been running their mouth and jumping bandwagon to bandwagon. I promise you, I've been taking mental notes. I've been taking screenshots. And I'm going to put them all on social media, J-Rock, and you can make a highlight clip on your show of what Ronnie Rotten does to fake Cleveland fans. (laughs) That will be something that is going to be a great sight to behold. Other question I have for you, Sports Fix fans. Do you think it's the Cleveland media's fault, or do you think it's us as the fans? Both. And I'm not speaking as far as, as, as true fans as, as us go here at the Sports Fix who, who root through and uh, you know hang around the downside. I'm talking about the people who jump ship the second things go wrong here. Do you think it's the media's fault for the way they do things uh, and portray Cleveland, or do you think it's our fans' fault? For, or for being so easy to jump off the bandwagon and then back on. As a player, as a, as a LeBron James or a Kyrie Irving or even a coach uh, or a GM, I could see how that is very frustrating uh, to not feel like, you know, your, 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 your fans have your back 100% of the oh, time. Yeah. And that's something I'm sick of seeing on as far as the football, basketball side, uh, and even the baseball side. So um, with that being said, just want to know your guys' opinion on that. And uh, J-Rock, I'll let you get into some stats. So you guys have a great day, Sports Fix. Go Cavs. My man, great phone call. And I'll tell you what, guys, keep those calls coming in, 216-539-7535. I've got to get to the break. He made some great points. Uh, I blame the media. I'll tell you, I think back, first off, nobody rides bandwagons in this town worse than the media. I'll, I was there in the 2010-2011 season when they lost 27 games in a row when they were just one of the most abysmal franchises in NBA history. And let me tell you something. I picked and chose my seats in the press box. I sat where I wanted and put my feet up. You didn't like it? There wasn't nobody to complain about it. It was me, three bloggers, and the preacher for the Cavs watching. There was nobody covering those games. There was nobody down there watching that team. Now, it... it, Exact opposite. And I do believe that they're so trigger quick with the bandwagon BS on the radio. You guys know I think the garbage that the fans are subjected to in Cleveland Sports Radio anyway. I absolutely think. Do you know how many fans or friends of mine, people that I've known that over the years have felt shamed by the media, shamed by these people that, that, that have the big voice to be in fans that are foolish and, and stupid for support? this team and that team and don't you know the reality and 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 I'm telling you so many fans beaten upside the head it's where and there are bad fans but there's horrible media in this town that creates some really bad fans I'm going to talk more about that after the break I've got Dan Wismar trying to join me here's the break here comes the news Dan's with us next don't go anywhere monster ooh feel like a monster baby monsters are champions can the Cavs do it let's talk to Dan Wismar about that and the Indians when we come back after the news here on The Sports Fix. The secret side of me I never let you see I keep it caged but I can't control it So stay away The Sports Fix Your choice for intelligent talk That was wonderful Bravo I loved that That was great uh, intelligent talk. Well, it was pretty good. Well, it wasn't bad. Well, there were parts of it that weren't very good. It could have been a lot better. I didn't really like it. These guys must be on the wrong station. It was pretty terrible. It was bad. It was awful. I'm dead. Get them away. Hey, boo. boo. The Sports Fix. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Hey, guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmsted, the UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio. You can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks. And every day of the week, there's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one 
unbelievable sandwich. You have got to get a bison burger while you're there. So whatever you're looking for, whatever day of the week, Monday through Friday, Saturday, Sundays, there's something for you at the Harry Buffalo North Olmstead just outside Great Northern Mall. Check them out today. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and, and starts, starts getting, getting real. real. Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Yeah. Nobody, Nobody does, does that, that like, like Fantasy, Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Visit fantasyjocks.com, your fantasy sports superstore. Championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. Good morning, I'm Bob Picosi. The MRI was taken yesterday, but there is still no word from the Warriors on the status of center Andrew Bogut for tomorrow's Game 6 of the NBA Finals in Cleveland. Bogut was helped off the court with an injury to his left knee on Monday in Game 5. ESPN NBA analyst Tim Legler on what Golden State does if Bogut cannot play. The back line of their defense now looks entirely different. So without Andrew Bogut, it's obviously... More minutes for Azili because you're going to have to play some bigs. But Golden State will play with Draymond at the five. That'll be their primary lineup in game six. The Warriors lead the series 3-2 game six tomorrow night at 9 Eastern time on ABC and 8 Eastern on ESPN Radio. The Dodgers may learn more today about the status of pitcher Kent Maeda. He left last night's game against Arizona after he was hitting the leg on a comebacker. He is expected to make his next start. The Monday morning quarterback reporting the Dolphins safety Rashad Jones reported to minicamp this morning. He didn't show up yesterday for the start of the mandatory camp. He wants a new contract. Former Olympic sprinter Oscar Pistorius, a double amputee, walked on his stumps in court today in South Africa in the sentencing hearing. He's been charged with murdering his girlfriend. Sports Center is brought to you by Golfsmith. No matter what your average score is, the Master Club fitters at Golfsmith can lower it. Improve your consistency and accuracy. Get fit for the right clubs for you at Golfsmith. Anything for golf. We here at the Sports Fix want to make all of your dreams come true. What about my dream? Edith, I told you I can't build your candy house. It will fall down. The sun will melt the candy. It won't work. It will if it never rains. Oh, maybe not all of them. Get your fix on the Sports Fix. Hey everybody, this is Jerry the King Lawler from WWE, and you're listening to The Sports Fix. Welcome back to The Sports Fix. Man, Cleveland Sports take you on that fantastic voyage like my man Coolio as we get back to it. Jay Rock Daddy with you. Dan Wismar from Everybody Hates Cleveland hanging on the phone line. He's joining me in just a moment. Update from the news that you just heard. It is now official. The Warriors have declared center Andrew Bogut out for the remainder of the series. So even though the news break told you that it was still up in the air, that is officially decided. And I'll tell you what, I think that's a bad thing matchup wise for the Cavs. Bogut was a handle, you know, hard to keep a handle on as it was on the boards. I think now you move green to the five and that creates, I mean, hey, Tristan can keep up with them out on the three point line. But if you're dragging Tristan out there, then who's getting the boards for the Cavs underneath? I mean, you're going to need LeBron to, he got 16 the other night. He's going to need to do that again. Um, and, and still, I don't know that you want to continually pull Tristan away. And, and Mozgov doesn't have a chance in the world to keep up with Draymond Green for an extended period of time. He's somebody I would want in near the rim, not 
wrangling out near the three-point line. So we'll see how that plays out in the Cavs' favor. What say you? Can the Cavaliers, Can they, forget the series, can they force a Game 7? Do they win Game 6 or do the Warriors win Game 6 again and back-to-back years celebrate a championship in the queue? What do you say? 216-539-7535. Facebook.com slash the sports fix, which I never even gave out the social media to start the show. Tweet with us at the sports fix CLE email, the sports fix at AOL.com. I'm going to go to the phones because we're going to talk about all of this and more. Cannot wait to see. Last time I talked to Dan Wismar, it was Golden State, huge two, Cavaliers zero with a big zero, and uh, things have gone up and down since then. Let's check in. Dan the man Wismar, how you doing, my friend? J-Rock, my man. I'm doing fine. How about yourself? Hey, I'm all right, man. I mean, I'm, I'm a little bit... Worse for the wear physically oh, over the weekend. Boy, did I take a L. But uh, other than that, man, I'm I'm doing the thing. We're talking some Cavaliers hoops, and that's hey, we're we're alive and here on a Wednesday, as my man Tracy Smothers would say. What's better than that, man? That's right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, a week ago, it was two zip, and we were all a little down at the mouth. I gotta say, uh, but um, obviously they uh, they picked it up. I, I you know I like the chances tomorrow, Derek. I don't know about you, but uh, I think we grabbed a little momentum, Draymond or no Draymond. And, uh, you know, I just uh, – this thing's building for a game seven, and uh, the drama could not be uh, could not be heavier. Um, it's just uh, – it, it, you know, the cynical people say, well, this is what the NBA wants. The NBA engineered this to make this happen. I don't buy into that. Uh, clearly, the NBA would be happy if, uh, if the thing went seven. But, uh, you know. They, they they would have been happy last year if it went seven and it didn't. So I, I'm not I'm not buying into that. But I, I do like the momentum. Uh, I'm think keep thinking about the old uh, the old Beatles song with a little help from my friends. I, I just hope Kyrie and LeBron get a little help from their friends uh, tomorrow night because they're going to need it. Oh, absolutely. And I think we'll we'll talk about the specifics of what it'll take. But let's go back. As we said, it was the first two games last time you and I were on the air together. Um, look through the, that voyage there, through games three, four, and five. I will say this. I was talking to some guys last night. If the Cavaliers do not uh, complete the miracle comeback and, and win this thing, uh, if they don't defeat the odds that are against them, and there are some heavy odds against them, I obviously... Two of the lessons that you could take either way you go is, A, uh, don't wait until Game 3 to show up for the NBA Finals. I mean, I I think they'll spend the entire offseason kicking themselves about not just losing Games 1 and 2. That's understandable on the road, but I think it was the manner that that happened. But in all reality, if the Cavaliers do not win this thing they will look at game four and that will be uh the reason that they didn't because had the Cavaliers not fallen apart in the fourth quarter of game four uh they would be the team with the lead heading into the final two games of this series and the opportunity to clinch on their home floor instead of the pressure being the other way around so I think if there's that one moment that you look back to it's going seven minutes in the fourth quarter of game four with horrible offense and not not very stellar defense to match it, and you quickly go from a game that was in your hand and heading to the West Coast tied at two to a three to one deficit. Yeah, that's right. That was an ugly stretch. No getting around it. Um, the offense really just came unglued, and you know, at, at some point you have to give credit to the opponent, and, and uh, they're a very very good defensive team. They turned it up. Uh, we talked the other day about. Just the Warriors' intensity. Their intensity is not something that comes and goes. It it, it went away briefly in uh, you know uh, what was it game two? I game guess it three. was that, that we were talking about. Yeah, game three. Well, no, I'm, I'm talking about even in the, the game. I think it was maybe even game one where the Cavs had a, 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 a you know a comeback, came back from a big deficit, uh, got close. It was right before the deli shot to the groin. Uh, and uh, oh, in the you know, opener, that's where, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's where the momentum turned, and 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 Kerr said, "Hey, we lost our intensity for a minute." You know, as if that was something unusual. They don't normally do that. Uh, that that allowed the Cavs to get back in. Well, they they just it just seems to me they are the more focused of the two teams in terms of just having that even keel intensity all the time. They certainly turned it on in the uh, in the fourth quarter of Game Four, and uh, uh, you know turned the tide there and just you know stretched the lead from a couple points up to up to a dozen and you know that game was over and, uh yeah you're you're right though that 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 will be one that the opportunity was there and just like the opportunity was there for the warriors uh 
the other night. They had a closeout game at home, and uh, they, they couldn't deliver. So um, it, it was a stunning uh, exhibition you know by LeBron and Kyrie, though. Especially Kyrie, I just couldn't couldn't believe uh, uh, how he was finding the, the bottom. Well, you know, though, look at what they did. They did what you and I and many others like us have talked about for two years now. They played, they switched it around and let Kyrie be the shooting guard and LeBron be the actual point guard. Had Kyrie running through screens and back cuts and and just running without the ball, and then LeBron would find him. And I honestly believe that, if for, forget this series, if the Cavaliers played a full year or two like that, Kyrie would learn how to be the one of the greatest point guards in the game because he could learn from LeBron's court vision and how he masterfully runs the offense while also freeing up Kyrie to do his thing because that's what made it work. But it was it was an unbelievable effort by the the two of them there. I want to ask you though because you, you know we talk about game 5 and the Cavs doing what they had to do to me and I, I, I bro I'm I'm sitting here till the the last buzzer hoping that the Cavs win this thing and I'm in it to win it but I honestly believe that the Cavaliers won game 5 mainly due to the lack of Draymond Green being in the game I mean I've said it before he is a dirty player he gets in people's heads for that very specific reason, but he's also one of the best defenders in the entire NBA, and he's probably the best defender on the Golden State Warriors next to Klay Thompson right there. I mean, he's, to me, he's a big difference maker defensively to what the other team does, and he has kind of affected the Cavaliers through the first four games that he was a part of in so many different ways. I'm not... Building a statue to Draymond Green, I can't stand him. He's dirty as hell, but he's a very good defensive player. Even if you consider that being dirty, that still works because, like, at the end of game uh, four, he got in LeBron's head. LeBron made two consecutive horrible decisions to take the ball, run all the way down the court, run right into Draymond Green and try to teach him a lesson and get the ball stripped away from him both times in a row. Golden State hit a three on the other end and extended their lead by six points in a matter of 15, 20 seconds. And it was clearly LeBron got ticked off, went after the guy, and they got what they wanted out of him. And then then the league suspends him. I wanted to ask you, with that in mind, I mean, I, I don't know if you saw the Tim Donahue stuff, but I was mentioning it at the beginning of the show. And, and of course, he's the crooked referee that went to prison for monkeying with NBA games just a few years ago, by the way. But he brought up a couple of good points. He said there's absolutely no doubt that the NBA made the decision they made. And I agree to suspend Green there because it gave the best potential to extend the series. Just like in the previous series, the decision not to suspend him gave the best potential to extend the series for the entertainment and financial value of the league. I find that fishy, especially when he, you know, he threw in the point that especially in playoff film sessions, uh, the officials seemed to almost be leaned towards favoring the teams that are behind in the way they make these calls. I have gotten more complaints, and not just from Cleveland, but fans across the country, because we've got fans all over the place, about the awful officiating in this entire NBA playoffs. 1-16 to every round, every team. Everybody's got a complaint about bad officiating. And, and and all of that stuff together. I've just got to ask you. I, I don't believe the NBA picks who's going to win and, and all of that. But I most definitely am more convinced now than ever that they put their thumb on the scales of the way these games are played and monkey around with the, with the outcomes as far as how they call these games. And I think the finals have been a, a blatant example of that. I truly felt that the Cavaliers beat both Golden State and the referees to win game five. Well, if, if that's the case, then that goes against your theory. Um, you know, because if they wanted to extend the series, then, uh, you know, um, they, they wouldn't, have, you know, we wouldn't have had to beat the referees. Well, anyway. what I mean, what I yeah. mean by that, let me, let me, let me clarify, because you're exactly right. What I mean by that is that when the Cavaliers had gotten the double digit lead, all of a sudden, there was a stretch where the Cavs couldn't buy a call and the Warriors were getting to the line. They were getting that. That's what I meant. And you literally felt like, once again, the, the game was trying to be swung. And I'm not saying that the league wants a Guys have to make the shots. They still have to go in the basket. Right. The Warriors go five minutes without scoring a point. Uh, 
um, you know, that, that was one of those things. I just yeah, think that, that they quarter. put their thumb on the scale in general, yeah. and, and I see it I'm, now more I'm, than ever. I don't know, Jerry. I'm, when, I, when I see NBA officiating just as bad as, you know, you say all the playoffs. Let's take games 1 through 82 and throw yeah. that in there, too. When, when the league doesn't really have a vested interest in, uh, in, in having a thumb on the scale one way or another. But they do. Um, they do, though, because teams have to make runs. The Philadelphia 76ers still have to make a run even when they lose 70 games in a season because otherwise nobody's going to sit through those games and they're trying to sell as many of the few tickets that they can sell to see some of these god-awful teams. I just think it's funny. The, the catchphrase of the I league think is well, everybody... Yeah, I, just think of, I just think officiating is bad, and, and I have a hard time believing that the, the league has a uh, periodic uh, daily, weekly, monthly sit down with the officials and say, okay, here's what we're doing, guys. Here's who we're trying to help. Here's who we're trying to hurt. Um, you know, no, here's, I, the way we, here's the I way we want you like to that. call it. I'm, I don't think I'm it's like not, that. I'm, I'm unpersuaded about it. I don't think it's like that. I do think that there I, – I definitely think that people it, – it's not just that. It's it, Like I was mentioning Tim Donahue and what he said. He It's not that they sat him down and said, here's what we want you to do. It's when you look at the way they're instructing you to call games in particular situations. And, and that I do believe. I believe that – you know, these guys know. I, I'm telling you, I, I, if I was an official, I would have a hard time not getting caught up in the momentum of a team making a comeback and the home crowd and make all of a sudden I might be blowing a free or whistle. And I, I'm just saying, like, yeah. well, I that think, was some ridiculous. And then well, let's get back to the Draymond Green thing because yeah, uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of different opinions about that. Uh, what do you think about guys, that? So I, you know. I tend to agree with Windhorse, who I've heard a couple times talk about, who says that the suspension for Draymond Green was absolutely a no-brainer. Um, that uh, the two flagrant fouls, the one on, there are rules that govern these things. LeBron was charged a flagrant one. Why? Because it was considered a taunt without yeah. contact, which is a flagrant, you know, one shot, uh, you know, and the ball. Um, you know, uh, Draymond's, you know, flagrant was with bodily contact unnecessarily, uh, and and uh, his was to find as you know a flagrant two or whatever two shots in the ball, and um, and then the suspension for Draymond was you know like a point lifetime achievement award kind of thing for the for the playoffs you know you get so many flagrants and you have a suspension you know that that was what the league decided to do and 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 Wendy believes that it, that that was absolutely uh, uh, an easy call to make, uh, a, a you know, no-brainer call to make. So outrageous judgment call by Kiki Vandeway in the league to do that. Um, I, I don't, don't think, I think it was uh, outrageous, Draymond, by the way. Draymond uh, earned the suspension. He, he is time achievement award for his uh, in total. I'm with it, and that's not just my homerism talking. I, I think he, he has clearly piled up enough infractions to, to merit the suspension. I think they did the right thing. I agree there. I don't think it was an outrageously crazy decision. Just that being said, yeah, the t- again, the timing. It doesn't matter. It's so hard to do this while the Cavaliers are playing because it's impossible to do this without it appearing that it's simply about the Cavs, but it's not. I've watched a ton of games this year, season and postseason, that have nothing to do with the Cavs, and I've felt the same way all along. I just wonder if, if what can you do as a league – to eliminate that belief, do you create some type of an independent count, uh, type of thing that's in charge of the officiating and and put something, you know, do you do something like that? Because I do believe that no matter what is true and what isn't, there's a shaken t- trust in the public towards the league and the officiating. And, and I've heard it enough. I mean, I've got hundreds of messages throughout the playoffs, not just about the Cavs, about how the league's rigged and they pick who they want to win or lose. I'm not going that far. But I think that there's a shaken trust in the public. Does the league need to address that in the off season? Well, I think they do, especially when you see ridiculous calls being made in the heat of the game and in key key moments, like the other day. The best example that ball that that, that uh, Kyrie the Kyrie the one where he was on, a foot on away. That, oh. that thing was that thing was six inches inside the sideline. Yeah. Never came yeah. close to touching the sideline, and yet there's a call. Um, you know, and it was a you know, I guess you could say there are no unimportant moments in a in a uh, NBA Finals game, and so you know, you know when you when you have a call like that in the game, that's a turnover. If any turnover is important. Every possession is important. So you just can't have calls like that, especially when it's 
seemed like it was a guy who was caught up in the emotion, and it, and it wasn't a call base that I saw the ball hit the line, and because I, clearly he didn't see the ball hit the line, it right. didn't hit the line, you know. So uh, you're right, there's emotion involved, and uh, I just maybe just colored me a little bit less cynical than some people. And I hear you. I'm curious what the league does about that because I do think that it's going to continue to be something that's brought up. And I think you have to do something for even for appearances sake. And that's why I was saying maybe you get a, a an independent group that, you know, much like these groups have to do when it comes to drug testing. They've got to have whoever's in charge of it isn't. They're not us. We, they're not under our banner. They're their own units, and they make their own rules. I don't know, but there's there's definitely shaken public trust. That being said, let's get back to the hoops on the floor because by the time you and I talk again, we're gonna know what happened. W- will the Cavalier? Will they? What do you think? Will they even force a game seven? I do believe they do. Um, I don't think a they're gonna want. Golden State to celebrate here. I think that they know it's do whatever you got to do to win one game. Nobody's thinking about uh, a game seven here. I'm not going to lie. I have my worries about a full complement of Golden State in game seven. But that being said, they've got to get there first. What do you think? It's going to take 41 and 41 the other night. And not just 41 and 41 from Kyrie and LeBron. I wanted to bring this stat up too was the usage. I don't know if you saw it. But LeBron's usage rate was 36% in Game 5. That's almost 6% higher than his highest high that it's the average during the playoffs, which is even higher than his regular season average. I mean, that means that he he and he alone, you know, was the was the go through for nearly 40% of the of the stuff the Cavs did on offense, which is fine. They won the game, but that was incredibly high, and if Kyrie doesn't have the same night and if LeBron doesn't get those same jumpers that haven't fallen for two years to fall in Game 6, what do the Cavs do to win? Because it was Kyrie and LeBron versus everybody else the other night. Well, yeah, when you look at 112 points and 82 of them are by those two guys. Right. Uh, not, not a lot left over. Uh, first of all, a couple things. You know, they, they score 112 points, but they only made 10 threes. That's a very low number for them. Yes. Uh, and, and that's out of design. LeBron clearly was going to the rack, and he was not just going to the basket and looking to feed. He was going to the basket looking to finish. And, uh, yeah. you know, that that represents a, a change. Now, everybody knows, you and I and everyone else knows, that he's not going to be able to go to the rim uh, and get 41 uh, with Draymond Green uh, playing defense against him. Kyrie might get another 40, but LeBron probably won't. To me, what that means is, uh, you know, you've got to get J.R. Smith. Kevin Love has to make some shots and get, make, get you know, score more than two points for you. And, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, Channing Fry can get in the ball game and uh, Delhi can score a few points for you. And, uh, you know, uh, J.R. And, and, and Tristan going to have to put the ball in the hole a little you- bit too. So, you I just said a lot of names about, there, you know, Dan. A little help from my friends. Uh, you, you're going to have to get more balance. You just said a lot of names there, and I didn't hear one. Just like none of us heard in Game Five on the scoreboard at all. Kevin Love. Yeah, well, yeah, I mentioned him, but he only had two points. And, that's what I'm uh, saying. You know, that, that's another. That's another topic for a discussion when we have a little more time, I think. But uh, you know what his future is with this organization. I don't think it looks real bright right now. No, um, but. Um, yeah, you're going to have to get some scoring for him. I wouldn't be surprised if they if they come out and aggressively try to get him rolling like like they did a couple earlier times in the playoffs when it was clear from the opening tap that the idea was get Kevin Love off the you know off the Schneid and and get him get him rolling. Um, that would help a lot. And um, you know he, he's one of those guys that's going to have to really step up in this game. So you know I, I think we'll get to Game Seven. I really do. I, and you know if you can't. You know, it's like you say we'll get to Game 7 because the Cavs don't want the Warriors to celebrate on their home floor. No, the Cavs will win because it's Game 6 of the NBA Finals. Damn and, right. And if you can't crank up the intensity and the emotion and the and the desire in, in that game, then when can you? Uh, and you know what, Dan? So I, Go ahead. I just wanted to mention uh, talking about what you would, what stories you learn and what you could talk about after uh, this series is over. And I think about you know some of the great teams and, and some of the teams that have truly over the years grew, grown together uh, through losing one or two NBA Finals in a row. And I honestly can say, however the Cavs lose this, you, you can almost see that in them. I mean, obviously shorthanded last year. You come back this year, even the guys that were healthy had never been there. Kyrie had played a little bit in the game one and, and then went down last year. And I think one of the lessons that 
especially a guy like Kyrie and Tristan learned, and I think they learned it in the first two and maybe the first four, but really the first two games of the series. Did you see in game five how they, it was the first time I've ever seen the Cavs dive for every loose ball, every hustle point, every, everything. And I looked at my son and I said, doggone it, they finally are playing like every single possession matters. Like one bucket could be the difference in the first quarter to whether you lose at the end of the game. That has been something you and I have talked about. And I yeah. think you can see that growth in them as a team through last year's finals and into this one. And I truly could see whether, and I'm not capitulating. Hey, whatever happens, happens. If if Cleveland's going to win a championship, we might as well do it in a way that it's never been done before. But even if they don't, you can truly see the growth and how they learned the importance of that. And I could see the lessons from last year and this year bearing fruit next year. And I'm not trying to do that already. I'm just saying you really can see the growth, especially in Kyrie Irving. Right. And, you know, you can look at that in a positive way and a negative way. You can, you can say, where the hell was it in game one and two? And why wasn't it there? And is that a function of coaching or is it a function of character? Or, you know, why? Uh, did we wait till game five before we saw it 100 percent all the time? Um, that's, you know, I've admired yeah. that about the Warriors. They seem to give it. Now, nobody can give it every guy every minute. But, you know, they have come as close to anybody that I've seen here, you know, um, and I've admired it in them. I've noticed it in them. We've talked a little bit about it. And, and the Cavs have, have at times just been seen, seem to be uh, not sleepwalking, but, uh, you know, pacing themselves or, or whatever, however you want to put it, hasn't been there. And that, um, so you can look at that intensity that you see and, and, and applaud it, but you can also say, why haven't we seen it since day, game one? I'm with you, Dan. Uh, when we come back next week, we're going to know how it went down, and we're either going to be making plans for the parade or, or talking about the, the breakdown of things, man. So exactly. Hey, i got about three, four minutes to go. i got a 1 o'clock meeting, but let's let's touch on the tribe. If we Absolutely. Could for, uh, just a little Last bit. night. Last night was it's a tough a, one. The the Shaw blew that one, man. And I hate to I'm not a big blaming one game on one guy thing, but doggone it, they had that one locked up and uh you know, the error well, it wasn't ruled an error, but the error got the guy on base and then the hit, the home run, and there you go. And then they get two on in the ninth. Kipnis couldn't get him in. But uh up until then they had managed to get rolling some more since you and I talked the tribe had added two and a half or two games to the lead that they had and, and were closing in on getting a, a, a nice little lead built up. Kansas City has chopped two games off of that here as now as we speak. It's a one-game lead wrapping up uh, one more game left in that series tonight between Kansas City and Cleveland. Yeah, uh, in the last night, I was I was really exhausted. I was trying to stay up and watch the game, and I, I put out a tweet right there when when uh, after the seventh inning, and I just said, "Hey, if, if Brian Shaw's coming in, I'm going to bed." And uh, and I did. By the time I got up to my bedroom, I checked my phone, and the home run had been hit. And, and I said, you know, I obviously made the right decision to go to bed when Brian Shaw came in. I don't understand, Jerry. We've talked about it. The Tito's uh, faith in Brian Shaw. Uh, I tweeted out this morning. I said, you know, it reminds me of the old line, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves. You know, it's, uh, you know, you're going to keep going with a guy. He, he's shown to be unreliable. And yet Tito somehow has this blind faith that, He's my eighth inning guy. You know, I would much rather at this point in the season, based on productivity, be seeing Daniel Carroll in the eighth inning, Jabba Chamberlain in the eighth inning, uh, or maybe Manship, Tommy Hunter. I don't know, but the Brian Shaw thing isn't working. This is about the no. third game that he's blown, uh, and, and there's been a lot of other games where he's brought the gas can in with him and somehow managed to survive, but he hasn't been sharp. And uh, I don't know, I'm just uh, – uh, I was unsettled with Brian Shaw in April, as you know, uh, and uh, I'm even more uh, down on the guy now. And, and that was just a that was a big hurt last night. Oh, I agree with you, man. That one was a, a kick in the gut because you could have got that game back, and then you've got Kluber going and a chance to uh, take the getaway game before you come home. And the Indians, by the way, good news uh, on the we talk about the attendance all the time. Tribe says the ticket sales are looking really good for this weekend. I think maybe the Fan base is. Start- I think the first couple of weeks they were still. Even when the the tribe got warm, they were still 
Yeah, they do this a lot. I think people, now that we've hit the middle of June, they're going, okay, maybe these guys are for real. Got some uh, promotions coming up this weekend and a first-place team, at least as we speak. So uh, perhaps that bodes well for things getting rolling. Oh, by the way, speaking of uh, Jacob, or excuse me, Jacob's Field. Here I live in the past all the time. Speaking of Progressive Field, if the Cavs go to a Game 7, I don't know if you heard this or not, but because the RNC is going to be taking up the queue that week, if the Cavaliers push it to a Game 7, Seven. Rumor is that the Indians are going to open up Progressive Field for the watch party for Game 7. Sounds good. I, I'm going to try to be there because that ought to be a fun day. I don't know uh, if you heard that or not, but could you imagine that? That I mean, it's good enough out in the plaza, but fill up uh, Progressive Field there and have the the try or excuse me, the Cavs on that brand new big scoreboard they've got and a potential championship there. I mean, uh, could be a heck of a moment. Wild. Hey, could I got to fly, my friend. You got it. Dan, thank you very much. We'll catch up next week. Right. Right. Thank you, sir. I hope we're talking championships when Dan joins us again, guys. Thank you, Dan Wismar from Everybody Hates Cleveland. He's with us each and every week here on the show. Make sure you check out Jim Pete and his great site, everybodyhatescleveland.com. Hey, while I'm getting back out of here, welcome back in. You're listening to the Sports Fix. J-Rock with you. He was Dan. He's gone. I'm still here. Shout out to Todd Leslie on iHeartRadio who sent us a comment, said it must be hard to do a show such as yours. I love it. I'm listening on iHeartRadio now. Todd, thank you very much. And actually, that's uh, that's interesting because at least I did not, I was not aware that the live feed of the Sports Fix was available on iHeartRadio. I am very well aware of the uh, the fact that. Ten minutes after we go off the air, we pop up on iHeartRadio. But that's some awesome news for uh, for the Sports Fix listeners as well. Apparently, the live feed of the show is available on iHeartRadio as well, which would make sense because I was making a note to some people the other day. I get the stats of, of all the different things that we do, and I had noticed a literally a, a huge jump in the last two mm, month and a half, two months, and I said, man, this kind of came out of nowhere. I didn't know if it coincided with playoff time. Now, it's one thing. We always have a steadily growing audience, but uh, when it's a big jump, you figure there's a reason. We always have a big jump at the beginning of football season, and then we have a drop-off when football season ends. It jumps back up when playoff time starts to ramp up for basketball. But we had already gotten the playoff jump, and then we had another huge spike and I said, well, this could be because of the Cavs. I wasn't really sure, and I believe we may have just figured that out. Awesome. So apparently the show is available on uh, iHeartRadio Live now, which is awesome. Welcome in to any of you guys that are listening on iHeart right now. By the way, Facebook, Twitter, email, phone lines all open. Let's talk to you. Can the Cavaliers win Game 6, force a Game 7? Can they win the whole kit and caboodle? How about that tribe? 216-539-7535, the number to call, 216. 216- Five three nine seven five three five. Can't get to the phone. Many of you use the phone to listen to the show. Facebook, Twitter, email. Let's do it. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Twitter at the sports fix C L E. Email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Again, two one six five three nine seven five three five. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Twitter at the sports fix C L E. Email the sports fix at AOL.com, and I'm going to jump on the phone here in just a moment. I see you. I've got calls in the queue. Um, Real quickly, though, getting back to that Tribe game last uh, last night, if you're listening live anyways, what a, what a kick in the gut it was because it was really a, such a well-played game up until that point in time. And, and speaking in general, well-played, I, I would really use that to describe uh, the baseball that we've been watching. It's just been really enjoyable, um, the, the brand of baseball that the Tribe's been out there playing, particularly – carried behind the pitching guys because we talked last week with Dan about that great run through the rotation and and they had another one uh, that was equally as tight I believe the last time through the rotation oh there it is last time through the the ERA was 2-5 as the 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 team continued to roll Josh Tomlin is just uh, unbelievable there I saw a stat about Josh Tomlin that was thrown at us a, a couple of days ago he's got more wins than walks on the season. How about that? Eight wins, seven walks on the season. You can't beat that for the... uh 
the little Texan, as my man Big Bob calls him. Speaking of you guys, I'm going to go to the phones and put it back on you. Caller, you are live, Daddy on the Sports Fix. Good morning, J-Rock. Good morning. This is my man, Bruce. What's happening, baby? Hey, a couple of things I need your help with. Hell yeah, let's do it. How you feeling first off, by the way? Uh, I feel great. How you feeling about the Cavaliers? Um, not bad at all, actually. I have I have still that face on them. Oh, what do you think? Seven games? Yeah, I think um we win we win tomorrow night. We go back to uh Golden State. You think it's going back? What What about Game 7? See, I'm not trying. Hey, guys. Now, see, Game 7. That's I'm, scary to me, isn't it? Yeah, I'm not I'm not that big of a predictor, you know? I kind of like to just kind of wait and see and let it play out. But I mean, I'll say if, this. If LeBron and Kyrie, I don't know if you can because it was a record-setting performance. I was telling a buddy this this morning. I said, when you look at Game 5, and you look at what the Cavs did to win, and you realize that it what it took, which is great, but when you realize that it took record-setting stuff, that it took super high levels of stuff, it's so hard to project or expect people to keep that up for three consecutive games because that is what it's going to take unless... Which is, to me, this is the magic that the the Cavs got to hope for. It's not, it would be nice if it was Kevin Love, but I think it's J.R. Smith. They need him for two games to just get that unconscious streak that he gets every once in a while where everything he throws up goes in. They need someone to help those two because I'm just scared. Even if you force a game seven, going back there, I mean, what are the odds that you get what you got out of both of those guys with Draymond Green playing? So I think that the Cavs, not only do they got to win game six, but I think they got to find whoever it's going to be that's showing up for Game 7 alongside Kyrie and LeBron. Well, I'd like to see J.R. and Love get involved in the game a little bit Absolutely. more. Absolutely. Kevin Love, see, that's the thing. Both Kevin Love and Kyrie Irving coming into this series, we all said, I think I talked to you before the series started, about how it was going to be a big key. Was those two, first experience in the finals and all of that stuff, and I think one went one way and one went the other. Matter of fact, I don't know if you saw this, Bruce, but many of you on social media uh, were sharing the graphic that we had put up. Kyrie Irving has outplayed Steph Curry uh, as far as this series goes with the matchup of the point guards. Kyrie Irving has outscored him. I believe they're equal in assists. He's shooting about 10% better than uh, Steph Curry is. Uh, Kyrie Irving stepped up to the game even before the 41 points. He had the back-to-back 30s, and then each one grew from the one before. You could see Game 3, Game 4, Game 5, Kyrie's confidence grow as he had a better night each and every one of those nights. I'm hoping that he can improve upon that some more. But, I mean, what he did, how much more can you expect out of the kid? But you get the opposite out of Kevin Love. He shrunk in the spotlight where Kyrie may have took a minute to get into it, and then once he was in the fire, he was in the fire. Okay, and on the other hand, Kevin Love... Do you agree? I'm not not just preaching. Do you agree or disagree? uh, I totally disagree. I mean, I totally agree with you. Oh, okay. Now, Kevin Love, who normally grabs, you know, a lot of rebounds, was getting hipped out of the way, you know? It's like, what is going on with this guy? He's not even, like, getting involved. And his boards are going to be even bigger with Green playing center for whatever's left of the series because whether they send Tristan out to guard Draymond away from the basket or Kevin Love, I think it would have to be Tristan because Kevin Love is just not swift of foot defensively, I think, to do that. But if it is if it is going to be Tristan, then Kevin Love is going to be the key rebounder. Him and LeBron are going to be the two guys that have to control the boards for the Cavs. I couldn't agree with you more, but the only problem with Green is is that Green is an outside shooter too. So right, you know well, that's you what I mean. You're gonna you're gonna him. pull, yeah, you're gonna pull the defender out to the three point line. So I right, mean, you got Tristan in his space, and you know, and there, there's still here's what got me was that every rebound there was three of them and only one of us. Absolutely, you know, 
absolutely. And that, I mean, you know what? That was crazy. That was one of the most impressive things to me. I, I was telling people, and maybe I get jaded uh, point wise. You know, I don't just totally get impressed by 30, 30 plus point games. Although when you start getting over forty, you know, that's a little something to talk about. But it wasn't just that. It was the the combination game. That that was the first one of those that LeBron had in this series, and it took until Game Five. Uh, that huge, not just 40 points, but it was the 17 rebounds, the seven assists. And it was, matter of fact, I believe Shaq in 2003 might have been, or 2004 might have been the last player in the finals to have a 45, 15, and five plus assist game. And so, but it was on the boards. There were a couple of rebounds that LeBron grabbed where he went up in the air and yanked the ball away and made sure that nobody else was getting it. And, Hey, credit to LeBron where it's deserved. I can't remember before Game 5, the last time I saw LeBron James on the floor for loose balls. He was diving for loose balls a couple of times in that game when the other players, I'll say this until the day I die, when the, the bottom bench guys see the, fuck, the, the $500 million a year, <laughs> uh, uh, big money, biggest star in the game, Diving on the floor for balls. That's when everybody starts diving on the floor for balls. And I think we saw the Cavs doing that. Exactly. And uh, when was the last time? Uh, let me check my memory back. I think it was like 07. You know, what? when uh, he played Detroit. Might have been the last time he was actually on the floor trying for something. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, no. You know when the last <laughs> time I saw LeBron play with and I don't mean just the points, but when I saw him play like he did, well, obviously last year's finals, he did. He didn't have any help, and I will he didn't give have him that. To help him, right? Exactly. But before that, it was 2012 when they when they beat uh, uh, finally beat Boston, and he had to just dig up that huge. He had a game like he had the other night: 40 plus points, 15 rebounds, five assists. He had a huge game against Boston that when he helped drag them through that st- game seven, I believe it was, and take the heat to the first uh, or to their first championship season. That was his second year there. Uh, that is when I saw that LeBron and it was there last night. I mean, well, or, or not last night, but uh, last game, excuse me. It was a couple of days ago. Right. But I mean, I, I just from the get go, I saw him hustling more. Because he knew how much it meant. It's winner go home, and that is so contagious. And like I said, when the freaking billion dollar guy is out there doing that, the rest of the players have no choice but to follow along with that. And then it was it was it was all across the board. He held everybody accountable. There were timeouts where he was screaming, not in a berating way, where he was telling them, you don't let that ball go. We can't lose one loose ball. When you move on defense, the, the, people thought that he was uh, dissing Kevin Love on the high five that went around on social media. Where yeah, right, right. He wasn't, it had nothing to do with a high five. He was explaining what he did wrong on defense, and Kevin Love was actually asking him a question, but it looked like he was you know, trying to give him the high five. Anyways, I saw that throughout the game, and and that is the stuff that you see in bits and pieces. But you saw it all together there, and I'll stick to what I said, man. I just I think if they don't win this thing, you can point to uh, you know just completely not showing up in the one and a half games in the first start of the series or the end of game four. But I think you can see as this series went on, people said, "Oh, this is the second year for the Cavs." It's not. It's the first year for most of these guys, especially the key, Kyrie's first finals. I don't care what anybody says. Kevin Love's first finals. I believe Kyrie learned more in this finals run than he's learned in his whole NBA career. Well, I know Curry has because his ankles are still bent. There were a couple where he... (laughs) Kyrie laid him up. Did he not? He was killing him the other day with a couple of those crossovers, man. Yeah, he didn't know which way Kyrie was going. And then he actually put somebody in front of Kyrie so he could just kind of, like, follow him. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Yeah, Kyrie had a great performance, no doubt about it. LeBron. All right, Bruce, we're going to find out, man. They've got to win game six before we can even get to game seven. So we're just all going to sit down, and we're going to put on our wine and gold Thursday, game six. So we're going to watch it, and uh, game seven will be, what, Sunday if it uh, if it goes down? Yes, so I'll tell you what, 
Uh, I, I can tell you now for a fact that if the Cavaliers lose, it'll probably be a week from today when we come back on the air. Uh, if they win, you can bet first thing Monday morning we'll be here doing it, baby. Uh, that we'll sounds be, great. And we'll be doing um, a show live from the parade. But anyways, there's a long way to go. I'm not even going to use that word right now. Uh, I don't even want to hear about parades. I mean, we had a pizza party for the monsters. Come on. You know? How ridiculous. They didn't even <laughs> give them a parade. They gave them the plaza. Yeah. Exactly. I talk about uh, stiffing uh, a champion, you know? You know what? They gave a bigger party to the Cavs the opening night two years ago when LeBron came back for that first game when they had the, the concert out on the plaza. Remember the first night? And then they lost? Oh, yeah. And then they lost right. the they game lost to, to the, the Knicks. Knicks. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but they no gave a bigger parade it. for that. So, you know, that kind of hurt me a little bit, you know, that, hey, you know, even the mayor showed up to the plaza, you know, he couldn't throw, you know, he couldn't agree to have a parade or anything, but he can show up to the plaza. Hey, speaking of the um, plaza and, and all of that, I want to ask you, you've got uh, some connections inside the Indians as well. Have you heard the same thing I did as far as Game 7 watch party? If it goes down, uh, the Indians perhaps going to open the gates to progressive field? Uh, exactly. That's exactly what I heard. And I heard it from uh, a gentleman in the front office. So apparently it's already uh, been approved and everything. Yeah, it just hasn't been announced. I think that would be I think that would just be an awesome scene, too. You know, especially um, being out, you know, it's outdoors, but it's in a stadium atmosphere. It'd be even more raucous than just the uh, the watch party. And by the way, my buddy's been down and- there for several of those watch parties. And I've heard from all over the place that they're. A, uh, a really good time. Fans have just been going wild through this. I'm not going to lie. Somebody asked me. Oh, please. My son asked I went me. To a what do you think? Baseball game. I had to walk through that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you, though. I, I, this is a question for next week. My son asked me the other day. He goes, Dad, if the Cavs were to win, are you going downtown for that? And I'm like, Man, of course, part of you wants to be there. Part of me wants to be safe because. I don't know what would ha- I mean it's it's going to be like getting caught in a mob scene in a riot scene when that goes down because first you get celebration but then you get drunken stupidity and a a mob mentality and I don't know man if I want to be down in the I do for the fun part of it but then getting out of there could be a scary scene because I don't know how Cleveland's going to react if the Cavaliers were, or any team. But, I mean, I don't know exactly how this city would react because while most people are good, uh, hardworking, intelligent people, there's some idiots in the bunch. I've seen them down there already, man. Well, there's no doubt about it. But, I, you know, i got to tell you, I've waited, you know, 52 years you or gotta go. to see a championship in this town. i got to be down there. you got to go. Just, I'm not talking about nature. the parade. I'm talking about being down there like, you know, game seven, watching it, you know. I don't know about being down there for Game Seven watching it, but I'd, I'd like what to I be mean. down there, no doubt about it. That's what I'm rather of course. home safe, like you. Yeah, of course I'm going to the parade, baby. I'm talking about. I don't know if I want to be in downtown Cleveland with fifty thousand people watching it, and they win, and these people just start going into party mode because it can go from friendly to scary real quick. Oh, no doubt about it. And, you know, I hope we're talking about this next down week. When people win championships, so. I hope we're, we don't know what would happen if Cleveland won a championship because none of us have the slightest clue, man. We could all break out a board of checkers and start playing Parcheesi. Who knows, <laughs> exactly. man? We'll find uh, out, next, uh, hopefully, before our, our lives come to an end, my friend, Brucey. Speaking of, let's talk about your tribe real quick, man. Last night was a kick yeah. in the gut. It was a kick in we the want- testicular region where the Indians appear to be kicked regularly this past week with their testicular bruising. Oh, that's added a whole new word to the vocabulary. A whole it, new so? word. How about my man Uribe? <laughs> what he, what, was it I'm Uribe? I'm not having any more babies. <laughs> he said, I don't think they have them in my size, man. I said, there oh, you that go. Is great. That's how that's you the answer best that line question. You've ever heard. You wearing a cup? I don't think they have them in my size. Bam! Yeah. His his <laughs> calendar, his social calendar, is no longer empty. I can tell you that. <laughs> I can tell you that, right? Exactly. Uh, but uh, yeah, he came up with some great lines like, "I'm not having any more babies," and <laughs> the trainer didn't have a cup my size. And oh uh, my god! Seriously yeah, though, Marty talk Feldman about your tribe a little bit. How you feeling? Though. 
We're sitting here in the middle of June, and the tribe's holding strong. That pitching is really getting stronger. Uh, the last month, they've really started to come into their own now. Uh, that's the point I wanted to bring up. Did you watch uh, that game last night? I mean, oh, I, yeah, I realize yeah. we've watched a million baseball games, okay? Did you right. have a feeling Shaw was going to blow that before it happened? Uh, I don't know, because, you know, the, the, the jaded Clevelander in me gets that feeling a lot of times, but... As soon as the guy got on base and I said, oh, man, this is – because, I, you know, I, I well, not only did I – I've played baseball all the way back to Little League, but my son's playing now. So I'm around Little League like two, three days a week, and you hear all those old playground adages all the time. So I constantly am aware, even more than the average fan, of literally how the one little ripple – you know how they say one one pebble can, can ripple the ocean and change everything? Same thing. It never fails in the sport of baseball. If you walk a guy with two outs, if you have an error and let a guy get on base, nine times out of ten, that guy's going to score because of what happened. And sure enough, as soon as that happened, I said, man, Shaw's going to give up a home run right here. And I wasn't totally serious. And then, boom, I said, oh, man. And then I thought, I still thought the Tribe was going to come back. When they got the two on, I said, okay, Kepnes will tie this thing up or maybe they'll – Maybe they'll pull it, the, pull this thing off, but the you know obviously didn't get it done. But yeah, as soon as he got on base, I totally saw the home run coming. I really did. It was before that for me because when he was pitching, he was throwing that slider and it was completely off the plate. Well, that's true. Yeah, you're right. And and I was thinking sooner or later he's got to throw one down the middle. And as soon as he did, you know, it was gone. So, I mean, he he has to throw a strike. Because he was all over the place. And he's done that like the last three outings that he's had. I mean, like Dan said, you know, he brings gasoline to the to the fire, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And Tito swears up and down, you know, that he's one of the best pitchers in the league and he's not going to best set up, man. Yeah, I and love, he's not going to change. I love Tito's answer after the game. He was asked, to, uh, you're going to look for alternatives. He said, I don't want to find an alternative. I just want this guy to figure it out. Yeah, I want him, to, I want him fixed. Exactly. Right. Which I do okay. like that. I do like that. We live in a society, and especially a sports world, where we give up too quick. And I do believe that that is that, – that, Quick, like the Cavs, people are already, you know, uh, Mike and Mike or one of them national shows this morning was already trading players off the Cavs and doing fantasy offseason, uh, how you fix the Cavs roster. And, and and I see I got messages. I got about a dozen during the finals. Trade this guy, trade that guy, trade this guy, sign that guy. And I'm going, man, so you guys want to start a whole nother season with uh, what Kyrie, LeBron, like four guys and a whole new team again. Meanwhile, look at the Warriors. I thought. Uh, Terry Pluto had a great article last weekend about just that when he said, look at how the Warriors are built, look how the Cavs were built. All of those players were drafted, developed, or signed and kept around for a couple of years. They built that team together. And you got to do the same with the Cavs. Now, I would entertain getting rid of Kevin Love because I've said from, I just wish we would have never traded for him because his style, it's just not, it doesn't work. Even though he has big games, I've just, I've never been a fan of that. Now, I wouldn't mind if they could bring in a, a player that would complement the Cavs. That is a move I would make. But anyways, right now, while the Cavs are still playing ball, people are already tearing the team apart and rebuilding it for next season. So I think Tito makes me happy from the fact that he doesn't fall for that. He is very big. He's a player's manager. He gives guys opportunities. That being said, Shaw's got a lot of opportunities, and I don't know. At some point, you got to give it up. I mean, think about it. Last year, he only gave up eight home runs the whole season. 60, right. 65, 64 innings, I think it was. This year, he's only pitched about 25 innings. He's already given up seven home runs. So, Clearly, something is wrong, and it may even be physical. That could be, and, uh, and he's gotten worse, you know, though, the only Bruce. Person that knows is him, and and Callaway's got a you know. A, here's a the magic thing. Way I think it may pictures. be. I think it may be an injury, and I'm sorry to talk over you there. I think it may may be something physical because he started the season like crap. Uh, what he got blown out the water, if you remember, he. Uh, 
10 flat ERA in the first part of the season. May, he was great. We uh, Dan was apologizing to Brian Shaw. He had a 1-5 ERA. Uh, it pitched well. June, it's blown right back up so far. Again, it's a small sample size, only four innings, but 0-2. 8.3 ERA, blown that game there. Um, uh, to me, I think that it's the sign of a guy who's a very good talent who is r- running on fumes after the usage that we've put him through the last couple of years. And I think that's one of the biggest parts of the problem is I think sometimes he just goes back to reach for it and doesn't have it. Okay, now his total job is to get three people out. That's it. Just get you us know? to the ninth that's inning, baby. That's all to do. Get us to the ninth. Remember how fast we ran Chris Perez out of town for doing the same thing? Well, uh, the, hang on. <laughs> Chris Perez was the closer who then got yes. all the time in the world before he got bumped out of the closer to the setup guy, and then he couldn't do it again. Now, that's a little bit different, but I am with you, and I think that... Well, I was thinking, you know, maybe if we move Shaw to earlier innings, you know, and let him pitch one inning and get back in the rhythm. Right. You have to do something like that. I'm with you there. You, you, I agree with that. You know, we're, we just kicked Perez right out of town. You know I mean? His dog was smoking weed, and the next thing you know, he's gone. Well, you can't but, stick your middle finger up to the town and have weed delivered to your house at the same time and get <laughs> busted. I mean, come on now. I mean, you were asking for trouble there. I know it was for but, his dog. Uh, it was for his dog. I know. It was just for the dog. Yeah. It was the dog. It came Anyways. in his name. All right, Bruce. We, well, well uh, wrap it up one more thing. Else? Um, the media in this town. It stinks. Okay. Well, yeah. Um, kind of. Um, okay. Now, you know, I have a, a strong dislike for the plain dealer. Absolutely, and you know what? I used to love the plain dealer, and I am slowly—not slowly—I'm more quickly by the day joining you on your perspective of that once great newspaper because it has joined all the other newspapers of the country. The Plain Dealer was one of the top 10 newspapers in the country. It, it, all the way up until my childhood, it was a very respected newspaper. But it's it's cookie cutter now. You guys know I travel the country doing wrestling. And, and not that you even need to travel doing this because you could do this right from home on your computer. But if you go around almost every major city in America now, they're, they're, you know, we've got Cleveland.com. It's the website for the Plain Dealer. It's okay. everywhere is the same. If you go look, you'll go, oh, that looks just like the Plain Dealers. Because it's now cookie-cutter news. It's all corporate. It's all uniform. It's, it's all little tiny blogs meant for quick internet exposure. There's no long-form journalism anymore. And I believe that they have just completely... Uh, trashed the plain dealer from where it was and it is not the employees of the plain dealer's fault it's northeast ohio media group who has fired they fired all the the newspaper people over the years they've fired all the true journalists over the years and they've hired a bunch of these hack bloggers here's my point okay yeah. the other day the monsters won they weren't on the front page nope okay and I tried to write to Plain Dealer, and you know I'm blocked, so they didn't uh, respond <laughs> to me. Um, He's blocked in general. He's like, night, I'm blocked. I'm blocked by just about everybody in town, Channel 5, everybody. I love it. But Well, here's the thing. Now, um, the, the same day, they were on the uh, front page of the sports page. I'll give them that, okay? All right. The Cavs won that big game in, in Oakland, and... Uh, Trump and uh, Hillary were on the front page of the paper along with uh, um, uh, the accident or whatever, the incident in um, Orlando. Okay, I'll give you that. But on the sports page was a giant picture of LeBron, and I believe he was high-fiving uh, Kyrie. And at the bottom was a quarter of the page was Liberty Ford proud sponsors of the Cleveland Browns. <laughs> yeah, I knew what you were going to say. They got to pay so, the bills somehow, Bruce. Yeah, that's what it comes down to. It comes down to who's paying the bills, you know? Yes, I do. All right, my man. And, what do you uh, say, Bruce? It, by the time about, we talk again, are the Cavaliers 
by the time we talk again, are the Cavaliers going to finish this thing off? Are they going to win it? Are they going to lose it? What do you say? I'm hoping with all my heart that the Cavs pull this off. I mean, not only for, you know, the city, but for themselves, the history of it, the whole nine yards. I mean, I'll be honest, I I would rather we'd have just won four straight. But if that wasn't going to work, if that one wasn't going to work, then what other way would you want Cleveland to win something than to do it in the most come from behind, ass backwards, never been done before way. Right. I mean, like they say, Cleveland and in, in the city of Cleveland, nothing is ever given to you. It's always earned. This is a perfect <laughs> example. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, it you you can love or hate LeBron James, but I can say that if the Cavs somehow finished it, I mean, bringing one to Cleveland anyway. He was going to get the statue. He was going to be the hero of all heroes for the rest of his life. But this, now you start using that L word that I hate to throw around, that legacy word, because, you know, were you there when this guy did that? Were you there when that guy did this? Were you there when the Cavs were down 3-1 to one and came back to win the finals? And, and hopefully now that's I understand that if LeBron was going to win this championship and then retire, you know? Then his legacy would be, like, outstanding forever, you know? But, you know, if, if he's not going to retire, then this is just another page in his book, you know? Oh, I, I, I agree mean, with you. I agree with you for sure, man. I mean, man, that would be I... the ultimate way to go out is to win the championship for your hometown. That would that would be, you know, the, the thrill of all thrills. But... You know, to come back and do it again after you, you know, you won your championship. Okay, you know, you won the championship for your city. You also won, you know, three in Miami, you know. You know, so, you know, it doesn't really, that part of the legacy doesn't really do anything for me. You know, I, I mean, I I love LeBron. I always have. And, uh, you know, I'm never, you know, not liked LeBron because he wasn't here. I mean, I like him a lot more here. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd rather, you know, have my championships here. But, you know, here's here's my, my thing on – here was my question on my page was, you know, are you going to be less of a fan if they don't win? Oh, God, no. no there's going to be. Well, oh, no, not. there's going to be. But, no, oh, absolutely not. There's people that only watch sports for championships. You know, if you don't, if you don't win a championship – And you know what, you Bruce – that's where I go back to this, these crappy fan, the fan and these stupid radio stations that they have in town. I believe that today's culture of no nothing, loud mouth sports talk jocks, they have shamed fans into becoming over the years those bad fans that you're talking about. Because now all of a sudden, if you are wearing your Cavs shirt while they- 27 in a row, every quote-unquote smart fan, every fan that's in the cool group that that's with these guys or they're with this Twitter posse or whatever, you're an idiot. You're a loser. Only you would support that garbage team. And when, when the world did it become a bad thing to support whoever you support, whether they win or lose, I go back to my daddy-o as a kid You'd have thought that I would have thought because I did think until I learned what wins and losses meant. I thought the Indians were the greatest team ever because that's all my dad wore was Indians hats, Indians shirts. We watched Indians games. We listened to the radio. We listened to the Indians. All of a sudden, I grew up and realized they stunk that whole time. Never even finished 500. You wouldn't have known it by my dad because he was an Indians fan. He couldn't care less. I mean, obviously, he wanted them to win, but. You know, if they didn't, he did what we all do. He goes, well, I guess we'll watch the rest of this year and then hope they get better next year. But I'm still going to watch them, you know, Browns, Cavs, whatever it is. And I don't get that. I get frustrated, and I'm in sports talk, Bruce. So I get reactionary just like everybody else when we're watching the games and I'm talking to my friends. But 
at the end of the day, I'm still here. I go back to what I said about the 2010-2011 Cavs and what none of these clowns that are falling all over themselves to take selfies at the queue now and, 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 and go try to get in the media room and say, look how cool I am. What none of them there? Because they didn't want nothing to do with a nothing happening Cavs team that couldn't do anything for them. But I think that that generation of crap-ass media that the fans have been stuck to have now created a bad mentality of the fans. And I think if that went away, that's what I mean. That's why I say the the the, the people on the air have created a, a bad set of fans because Cleveland fans are bad ass. And I think that many of them have been shamed over the years to think it's a bad thing to root for teams unless they're winning. You know what I mean? And I think that's garbage. Well, that's one thing, like I said, always bothered me, that people only watch, you know, games for championships, you know what I mean? Uh, and, I'm, you know, okay, I'm going to get to the Browns and send them back. I mean, I can't. I know. Bruce, got to wrap it up. I, Hurry up. Okay, I was just going to say, you know, but a Cavs fan, you know, like, you know, my question was, you know, like, you know, are you going to still be a fan if, even if they lose? And like you said, a lot of them said, you know, well, there's no sense watching them if they're not champions. You know, uh, what, you know, where did that come from? You know, like you said, it's, it's the local media, you know, that because they never even said that, the, you know, the Indians were 12 games out of the first place. You wouldn't even know they were still playing. I totally agree. I totally agree. I mean, I can think of many times in my life where I've been watching one of our Cleveland teams play and somebody came up to me and said, oh, hey, how they doing this year? And I go, Psh, last place, we stink. You know, and I'm still watching the game. Like, But, you know, like yeah. I, I, I've watched the Indians game and somebody that doesn't watch will be like, oh, hey, you're watching the Tribe. How they doing this year? Awful. Oh, why are you watching? Yeah. Because I like the Indians. That's why I'm watching, you know? Right. Uh, I mean, do you it's, it's do you stop talking? Do you stop talking to your son when you don't like him or when you're mad at him or whatever? Do you stop talking to your husband or wife just because they haven't been successful at something for two weeks in a row? You, well, I can't talk to you anymore. You're a loser. You know what? I, get out of here. It's called disloyalty. It's it's what's wrong with today's society. It's a fair weather society, and I can't stand it. Now I'll criticize all day long. Man, LeBron's got to play better. He's got to be a leader. This guy's got to hit better. That guy's got to pitch better. But I don't change my shirt. I damn sure don't become a two-year Golden State Warriors fans when before that I didn't even know what city Golden State played in. You know? Matter of fact, half of those guys still don't know what city go. Ask a Warriors fan what city they actually play in and and see how many go, uh, Golden State? Wait a minute. That's not a city. And they, they had good luck trying to figure out where Golden State plays. What is it, Oakland? Is it San Francisco? Is it L.A.? Where do they play? Most of these people don't even know. But they weren't Warriors fans until two years ago. They sure weren't Warriors fans when they were getting swept out in the first round of the playoffs. They weren't Warriors fans when they weren't even making the playoffs. Just like, and and that's one thing that I will say. The Cavs, during those crappy years, the media may have walked away from them, just like they do everybody in town. But Cleveland fans kept coming. The Cavs only lost 4,000. A game total average by the fourth year that LeBron was gone. That is pretty freaking impressive because they were the worst and statistically the worst NBA team for four straight years. And you would have never known it. But you wouldn't have known it. I was at the queue certain nights and they were, hey man, during that losing streak. Now I know the first year they had to buy the tickets because LeBron was still on the team and they made him renew in the previous season, but. Uh, they still kept coming out, man, and it obviously was three-quarter full houses instead of full houses, but I'm like, damn, that's pretty good freaking attendance, man. Matter of fact, those awful teams were outdrawing the Indians, and the Indians were playing competitive baseball at the time. Hey, the so, Monsters sold out the you. Damn right they, they did, Bruce. And the Indians did in first place. Damn right they did. All right, Bruce, I got to go, my friend. All right, and I will talk to you uh, very soon. Let's do it next week. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully for a championship. Yeah, hopefully for a championship, baby. 
All right, I'll talk to you later, Zero. You got it, my man. That was breaking up, and that's the reason I had to dump that call. Sorry about that, Bruce. Great call. You guys, keep them coming in. 216-539-7535. Give me your calls off the air. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Twitter at The Sports Fix CLE. We're going to call it a day. Indians, Chicago's coming into town. They're expecting big houses at Progressive Field. Cavaliers, this is it. Win or go home. They did it once. Now they come back home. Will they stay? I hope not. I think we got one more trip to the West Coast to go. Where where does where does Golden State play again, Warriors fans? While you're letting me know that, I'll be looking forward to getting back with you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel, live at noon, right here, baby, across the Sports Fix Radio Network. Dan Wismar will be back in the house, and we'll be here with you live next week, right here on the Sports Fix. Go Cleveland, go Tribe, go Cavaliers. Let's go. Come on, Cavs. How's it go? Got to make it happen. Come on, Cavs. Let's see what happens, baby. And we'll see you next week, Daddy, right here on the Sports Fix. The